So on our stage now, I want a warm Madrid BNI welcome for our Absolutely. CEO, Graham Weimiller. All right. Did you have a good break? Okay, okay. Be sure to thank our exhibitors and our sponsors. Get to know them, build relationships. We appreciate them so much, and we appreciate you. Uh, one of the ways that we want to help make this convention a transformative experience for you uh, is by having some legendary keynote speakers. And I had the opportunity to introduce our first keynote speaker for BNI's 2023 Global Convention. This is a keynote speaker that I've had a chance to build a relationship with over the last decade. I have been so impressed with his disruptive thinking, his understanding of current business trends, and where technology is changing the way the world is doing business. Dan Monahan is the founder of WSI, a large digital marketing franchise. He is also the founder of the Clear Summit Group, which invests in high growth, disruptive, growth-oriented companies. Dan is a board member of the International Franchise Association. And a few months ago, I had a chance to talk with Dan about artificial intelligence and his thoughts about how artificial intelligence is about to change this world. And so I asked Dan to talk with IFA members about that. Uh, and the content was some of the best content that uh, the IFA has ever put together. As business leaders, we want to be on the cutting edge of the best ways to support our clients and customers. And BNI has always been at the intersection of high touch and high technology. And so you're about to learn how AI is going to transform your life and your business, your life and your business. So it gives me a huge honor to now welcome our first keynote speaker of BNI's 2023 convention here in beautiful Madrid, Spain, Dan Monahan. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. We've got a lot of information to cover, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, just before we get into the presentation, I want to tell you that we're going to drink some of our own champagne here today because um, we're going to actually use AI in our presentation and actually create a summary of this, uh, this presentation. So if you click on that, and I'll put this up again at the end of the presentation for you, but you can actually download the slides from today, an AI summary of the session today, and access a whole bunch of other AI resources uh, for free. But first thing I want to do this morning, <clears throat> I want to take you on a time machine ride back to the year 1992. And in that year, I was running a publishing company. And one of my jobs was I had to go into a studio every month and create what we called an audio magazine. I would read all the magazines and newspapers that I could and CD-ROMs at the time. And I would talk about everything that was happening in technology and the economy and sociology. And, and, and I'd, I'd record this audio cassette. And... At the time, I mean, this was before the internet, we would mail these out to business subscribers around North America at the time. And it was kind of like an audio magazine ahead of its time. And I was talking about the information superhighway because this is what was headlines in all the news back then. People were talking about this 500 channel universe. Uh, all kinds of information would be available to all of us, but nobody knew if it was gonna be delivered through fiber optic, through satellite, through microwaves, or whether it was gonna be this internet thing that they were talking about at the time, which was really just for sending emails. And then in 1993, the researchers at University of Chicago invented the first internet browser, Mosaic. And at this point in time, I saw that this internet thing was going to be the information superhighway, because we could now send images over the internet, and maybe even video. And so I wanted to build one of these web pages for our company. 
And so I contacted a technical guy, and I realized that the technical people couldn't make a website look very good. And if I got a graphic designer to build it, it took forever to download on the page. If any of you remember those days, right? And even if I could get both of those on the same page, neither of them knew anything about internet marketing, how to drive traffic to that site, and how to convert that traffic into customers. So at that point in time, I launched a company called WSI, which was really designed to create these things, these websites for businesses around the world and has gone on to become the world's largest digital agency network. Now this was back in the year 2 BG, two years before Google. This was before search engines. <laughs> we used to, believe it or not, we used to use something called the Internet Yellow Pages. And it looked like this, and it was about two inches thick, and you'd search through for the topic that you wanted to look for, and then you'd enter that information into the browser, right? I want to just capture for you the essence of the confusion that was going on at the time. And for some of you that are a little older like me, you'll remember this at the time. This short little video will capture what the world was thinking about this internet thing at the time. <laughs> Millions of Americans own a personal computer. If you're one of them, you can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. Oh, that's that little right. mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. About, I'd always about, seen the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. Just what is this main artery of the information superhighway? Every business, no matter how large, no matter how small, will be on the internet in the year 2000. It's how, the primary way that people will look up information. It will replace the yellow pages as we know it today. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? Well, it's very hip to be on the internet right now. Right. There it is, <laughs> violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean... Well, well Allison what, should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network. Mm -hmm. The one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. What you, how does one? Not, what do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. With, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh. I'm afraid that if I subscribe to something like internet, you would really be hooked. I would get hooked, and I would never, you know, spend time with my family. Do you, well, and I also, it, do you, does it bother you at all that these are all people that you don't really know? I mean, it, everybody's you know signing on and having these conversations and whining together or griping together or whatever, to with people that I mean, I I don't know if I. It is group therapy of the of the nineties. Well, I just as I mentioned, I have no desire to be a part of the internet because I feel like I'm so inundated with information all the time that I don't really I don't want more. Don't you ever feel like it's just constant? bombardment I, know, I guess the thing I resent most is, is I would resent that, you know, at least when you're home, if the phone rings, you have the option of not answering it. On the internet, people can send you messages all the time, people you don't even want to hear from. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as funny as that might appear, it was amazingly prophetic, right? I mean, all that confusion, but they really started to connect some dots about how this could change the world, how it would change the way commerce would happen how it would change the way we as humans would interact with each other. And uh, that was really the birth at that time of a revolution that, as we all now know, has changed the world. And Victor Hugo, in his book Les Miserables, talks about how oftentimes a revolution isn't recognized in its time. It's recognized in the rearview mirror, in the pages of history. And I would proffer that today we are living in those same kinds of times, a point of confusion for many, but really a point of the birth of a new revolution. And if we look at what some others are saying about this, Sundar Pichai, head of Google, is saying this could be more profound than electricity and fire. Bill Gates himself is saying that this could be you know, as fundamental as the invention of the microchip and the internet. So this is extremely profound, the times we're living in, and it's all about this new thing, AI. And what is AI? I mean, truthfully, 
We've been hearing about this for the last decade. The last 10 years, everybody's been talking about AI this, AI that. And most software that you've seen or appliances or other things that have said AI on them, they're not truly AI. You know, it's smart algorithms, it's smart programming, but not truly AI. But the world got to see a change in that about a year ago, November 30th, with the launch of ChatGPT. And that took the world by storm. In fact, in less than five days, it reached over a million users. Less than two months, over a hundred million users. This was a, a dawn of a new age. It's what I call the democratization of AI because AI is now at my fingertips. It's at your fingertips. It's on an app on my 81-year-old mother's phone. It's at her fingertips. We now can all use AI. So let's talk a little bit about what AI really is. I mean, traditional AI, what's been around for the last number of years, has been limited to large corporations and big businesses. Because what it's required, uh, or large corporations, big governments, because what it's required is two things, large data sets, and huge computing power. And if you put those two things together with this programming called machine learning, the machine actually programs itself. It learns from that data. And there's two things that it becomes very good at. Number one, it becomes very good at making predictions. And number two, it becomes very good at spotting patterns. So we've been using AI, you know, or, or the benefits of AI over the last number of years. And so if you think about you know, Facebook content, recommending Facebook content, or recommending a product to purchase on Amazon, or recommending a movie to watch on Netflix. That's all using that traditional pattern recognition and prediction recognition uh, technology from AI. Uh, fraud detection, credit scoring, predictive policing, where they're surging police forces into areas, not where crimes have occurred, but where crimes will occur. Again, that prediction and pattern recognition. But this all changed in 2017 with, the, uh, with a paper that came out from Google called Attention is All You Need. And it described this new type of AI, this transformers, where we can actually train these things on all kinds of words or images. And it captured the imagine of Silicon Valley in terms of what would actually be possible with this new type of AI. And for those of you that have seen the movie Oppenheimer, it was kind of like that moment in 1938 when Otto Hahn and Fritz Straussman discovered fission in their laboratory. And it captured the imagination of physicists and set off a race to build the first bomb. Well, that's actually what happened in Silicon Valley. There was this race going on behind the scenes to actually build this technology, this new generative AI technology, and of course, it was released to the world in the form of ChatGPT. Now, how does ChatGPT actually work? Well, it's trained on over 300 billion words. So most of the internet, all of Wikipedia, um, hundreds of thousands of books. So that's how they train this thing to really start to think like humans. And what it developed is this human-like capability of creating new things. So not just spotting patterns and making predictions, but actually creating new things. And the other thing that it did, is it had this new ability to help us access information. So let me give you an example. If you walked into a library and you said to the librarian, you know, where can I find this information? And he or she would say, well, go down this aisle, find this shelf, find this book, and drill into this book. Well, that's kind of how Google works, right? Like Google gives us a whole bunch of blue links and then we go off and search for the information ourselves. But imagine if the librarian had read every book in the library. In fact, every book in the world. And you could now just ask the librarian the question and he or she would give you the answer. That's actually how it works with ChatGPT. That's how it works with this generative AI technology. Now, I have to warn you, it's not always 100% right. There is this concept called hallucinations, where sometimes it just makes stuff up. And I've heard it sometimes described as mansplaining, because it actually makes stuff up, but it states it very confidently, but it's not actually, all right? Um, but the reality is it's getting better and better, and that very rarely happens. Um, so what is now possible 
uh, with, with generative AI. Well, it can write content, and we've all probably heard about that and seen examples of that. It can create images. I'll show you some examples of that. It can create speech. It can go speech to text, text to speech. It can actually write computer programming code better than coders in many cases. It can create videos. It can actually compose its own music. There's all kinds of things this can do. And it's actually moving very quickly because when they launched ChatGPT, it was version 3.5 of ChatGPT. But three and a half months later, they launched something called GPT-4 which had an order of magnitude greater intelligence, a 10x leap in intelligence. So in instead of performing in the bottom 10% of the bar exam, it was now performing in the top 10%. So it's performing better than most university graduates, right? Now, AI and, and GPT-4 is said to have an IQ of about 155 when they run it through all the different IQ tests. Um, Einstein is about 160, uh, apparently. Um, Mo Gadot, who's a former head of Google X Labs, he said that at the current rate of development with AI, they're expecting that it could achieve an IQ of 1,600 in less than a year. Now, let's say he's half right. And let, let's say he's a quarter right we're still talking about a technology that will exceed the level of human intelligence in the not too distant future. So what does this all mean? You know, what does this mean for us and our businesses? Well, this is the first time in human history that we've ever been able to scale white collar working. It's never been done before, but we can now do that. So what would you do if you think about it? What would you do with a bunch of free interns? You know, free MBA students or law students or, you know, medical students. What would you do with that team of free interns? Because that's essentially what you now have at your fingertips. In fact, we all have new superpowers. We've got the ability to turn these interns loose for us. We've got the ability to tap into this brain power. It's, uh, for, for any of you that have seen that movie Shazam, in the movie, the character... He, he discovers that he's got new superpowers and he's got this new suit, but he actually doesn't know what his superpowers are. So he tries running through a wall and that doesn't work. He tries jumping out a window and that doesn't work. But finally, he accidentally figures out that if he points his fingers, he can shoot lightning bolts out of his fingers. So he's discovered his superpowers. And metaphorically speaking, I would say that we all have new superpowers. The question is, do we know what they are? Do we know how to use them? And so what I'm gonna share with you today is some examples of what some of those superpowers can do. And we're gonna start with something really simple. I'm just curious, just to get a read of the audience, how many people uh, have logged into ChatGPT? Okay, so about half the room. So we're gonna start real simple. It's a matter of going to chat dot openai.com and you set up an account and it's absolutely free. They've got a paid version, but the free version uh, is amazingly powerful. And uh, it looks like this, right? It's kind of like a Google screen. There's a, a bar where you enter in content there, uh, enter in whatever you want it to do for you. And now let's talk about some of the different functions that AI can perform for you. The first thing we'll talk about is AI is a copywriter. A lot of times people have that hit that blank page where they just have trouble getting started writing. They, they get writer's block, right? And whether it's writing a sympathy letter, whether it's writing a review to a negative uh, a customer uh, response, but you can ask it to write anything you want. In this particular case, I'm going to say, you know, create a job description for an accounts payable role in a small manufacturing company. And off it goes and creates that. Now keep in mind, it's not pulling this from the internet anywhere. It's actually creating this before my very eyes, right? Now I could have said create a, a job description for a controller or a CFO or for a pharmaceutical uh, company, okay? And if I don't like it, I just hit the regenerate button at the end and it recreates it. Right? I could have said, here's our company values, incorporate these into the job description. Right? So it, it, it acts as a writer, and it actually writes better than the vast majority of humans. Right? It's highly effective as a writer. 
It's highly effective for ideation, for coming up with ideas. Uh, some of you might have seen that article in the Wall Street Journal uh, recently where they, they pitted AI, ChatGPT, up against a group of 200 MBA students from Wharton, and they wanted to see who could be more innovative, who could be more creative. And as you might imagine, ChatGPT was more effective and uh, then the best MBA students at Wharton, right? And I'll just give you an example. Um, I was, we recently hired uh, a big downtown agency, so I'm from Toronto, a big agency in Toronto to rebrand one of our companies. So one of our companies, our product offering had expanded beyond the name of the company, and so we paid them $40,000 to come up with a new name and a logo for that company. I thought that was a bit extreme, but the president of that company wanted to go ahead with it. So that process is going on. And in the middle of the night, while this is all happening, I woke up three in the morning and I had an idea for a new company, uh, a new division of one of our companies. And so I went to ChatGPT. I said, give me a list of possible names for a company that does this and instantly gave me 10 names. Three of them were actually really good. Now, for any of you that have ever tried to register a domain name with you know how hard that is, right? Every word is gone. Even words that aren't words are gone, right, with dot coms. But I looked for the domain name for all three of those. One of them was available. It was actually one of the best. Right there in the middle of the night, I registered a domain name with GoDaddy on a name that was generated by ChatGPT. And then I went to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office online, just did a search. I thought, does anybody else got a trademark on this? Nope, no trademark available. So meanwhile, we're spending $40,000 to do something that I did in the middle of the night uh, with ChatGPT. Uh, let's just, let me just show you how that can work. So I'm gonna say, create a list of possible company names for a sustainable, eco-friendly clothing brand that specializes in organic materials and ethical manufacturing. So I'm like throwing the whole kitchen sink at this thing. And off it goes, and it's gonna create for me that list. Now it creates me a list of 30 names. I look at the list and I say, give me more like number seven and number 12. And off it goes again and now gives me some additional names. And I could do this all day long if I wanted and it would continue to fine tune that approach. So as entrepreneurs, ideation is a really big part of what we do. Whether it's naming products, naming companies, naming campaigns, right? This is an important part of what we do and AI is very powerful for that. So now let's look at AI as a marketing intern, right? Some of the work we traditionally give to an intern. So I got a bunch of customer survey feedback and I want to get that summarized and analyzed. And I might otherwise give that to a, a marketing intern, but I'm gonna give it to ChatGPT. So what I'm gonna do in this particular case, I'm gonna just use regular ChatGPT. I'm gonna cut and paste a bunch of survey feedback out of, uh, of a survey we sent out, Excel spreadsheet, cut, paste, drop it right into ChatGPT. Please, below is what customers are saying about our company. Please provide me uh, a summary of the themes in a table format with a column for materiality, materiality. So that's what I asked it to do. I mean, you could ask it to do anything you want. Like, that's just my specific request. And off it went analyzing all 150 of those comments. By the way, some of those comments were in Spanish, right? And it just converted on the fly and summarized it all. Now keep in mind, I could have put in 1,500 comments. I could have put in 15,000 survey comments. I could have, and, and it's, it doesn't matter. Again, we're scaling white collar working. Now here's where it gets exciting. I love this example here because I just trained ChatGPT on what our customers are saying about us, right? How else could I use that now that it knows that? Well, now I'm gonna say to it, uh, Using a customer feedback survey, please create several compelling response-driven Facebook ads that highlight the value of our services. So you see, as marketers, we're often talking about features and benefits, but we're talking about the things that are relevant to us. We're not necessarily speaking through the lens of the customer. It's now creating these Facebook ads based on what the customer is saying is great about our services, right? And as marketers, it's critical that we're constantly testing, but we got to come up with new content to be able to test. I can drop these ads into Facebook and within a few hours, I can see what's performing best, right? And then go back to ChatGPT and say, give me some more. So we can always be beating our existing control ads. 
Uh, let's talk about you and your own learning and how you can accelerate your own learning using ChatGPT because this is a critical part of staying up to date in today's world. So you're sitting in a meeting and somebody talks about, oh, it's just like when Jim Collins talks about In Good to Great, and you're like, I've heard about that book, but I've never really read it. So you go to ChatGPT and you say, give me a chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary of Good to Great by Jim Collins. Well, of course it knows Jim Collins, but it's read his book. It's read hundreds of thousands of books out there. And in fact, I could have said, give me a 1,500-word summary. I could have said, give me a bullet point summary. I could have asked it whatever I wanted. It's creating it for me on the fly. And I could drill into each of these chapters if I wanted. What about summarizing YouTube videos? You know, much of what we learn in today's world is on YouTube videos, right? L look, listening to what experts have to say. But you look at that video and it's an hour long. Do you really want to invest an hour of your time in it? You just don't know, right? So what if there was a way that you could actually drop the URL of a YouTube video into ChatGPT and it could summarize the video for you? Right? That's exactly what I'm going to do right here. Now I'm using something called a plugin, and plugins are a way of expanding the capability of ChatGPT in the same way that apps expand the functionality of our smartphones. And so I'm just going to use a particular plugin here, drop that uh, YouTube video URL in, and off it goes summarizing the video. Now I might decide, it's a great video, I actually want to watch the video, or I might decide, nah, I've, I've learned enough and let it, it's, it's time to move on. Now, you can also use ChatGPT's technology without actually going through ChatGPT. And I don't want to get too technical on this, but for those of you that are a little bit more technical, there's these things called APIs, where you, you can actually plug into the back end of that technology. And here's an example that we built using a ChatGPT API. So just imagine, um, in, now we have a franchise company. Uh, all of our businesses are franchise companies. And we have business coaches that work with our franchisees. And so what we've done here is we've created a system for our business coaches to manage the, uh, and, and to pro provide feedback to the franchisees. So in this particular case, franchisee is doing a sales presentation. Let's say, for example, selling tutoring services to their client. It's on Zoom. Zoom converts that into a transcript. The transcript is fed into ChatGPT against our framework, our seven-step framework of what a successful consultation looks like. The process that a franchisee needs to go through with a family when they're uh, showing them uh, our services. And then it out of that, it actually creates a coaching summary of how well that franchisee did on the sales call. It sends out an email summary of the coaching feedback to the franchisee, sends a copy to the sales coach, and pushes out a copy to a dashboard that looks just like this. And now we can look at how our different franchisees are performing, how our different business coaches are performing. We can drop down, you know, the, the date ranges. We can look at how they're doing on each of the different phases of our sales process. So the point here is we're not just doing the job of another human. In this case, I mean, our business coaches do listen to those recordings themselves and provide coaching feedback to franchisees, but they can't listen to them all. But AI can. We have AI now listening to every one of those sales calls and scoring them and providing feedback. Now, AI, AI shouldn't replace everything in the human. We, we, call keeping, we talk about keeping a human in the loop. So AI is going to flag that we got a particular issue with this particular area of the business or this franchisee, and then we can dive in deeper and bring a human into the loop to help with that. So this is an example of how AI can do very sophisticated human-like functions, in this particular example, coaching. So let's now look at AI as a graphic designer. So we've talked about how it can write stuff. Let's look at how it can design stuff. Now, there's three main platforms out there. There's lots more, but the big ones are Dolly 3, Midjourney, and Adobe Firefly. So let's start off by looking at Dolly 3. Now, this is by OpenAI, the same company that created ChatGPTs. So if you go labs.openai.com, you'll find a site that looks like this. Now, you just mouse over those images, and you can see the actual prompts that were used to create that image. Right? So that'll give you an idea. I mean, we're just using English language. We're just describing what we want, and then it creates it. So I was doing a presentation, and um, 
I was talking about the importance of digital marketing. When we generate leads, we got to be on top of those leads very quickly because oftentimes our competition is on those same leads. So I was trying to explain the concept of speed to lead. And I had this idea in my mind. I said, it's kind of like seagulls fighting over a French fry. You know, with that lead, it's like a bunch of seagulls fighting over a French fry. So I went to Dolly 3 and I said, create me an image of seagulls fighting over a French fry. And then it gave me a bunch of images, and I thought, it's not quite what I want. So I said, angry seagulls fighting over a French fry. And then I said, angry seagulls on a beach fighting over a French fry. And finally, I chose this one here that I put into this PowerPoint slide for my presentation. Now, keep in mind, that image does not exist anywhere in the world. That's not from Google Images. That's not from a stock photography lab. That is my creation that was created you know, using Dolly 3, right? So very, very, very simple to use. But this is where it gets really powerful. Midjourney, midjourney.com. Uh, so again, you can go to the site, midjourney.com, mouse over the images. You can see the prompts that they've used. I mean, incredibly photorealistic and lifelike. I can tell you, I'm part of a business group of uh, CEOs that run digital agencies. It's like a peer group. And one of the guys in our group does a huge amount of work for Hollywood, all the big studios that you would know the names of. And when he first looked at Dolly 3, he said, guys, I mean, this is really cool, but we'd never use this kind of stuff in our, I mean, it's just not at the level we, we would use. When Mid Journey came out, about three months later, he came back to the group and he said, guys, this is going to destroy our industry. He said, it's going to take about three years before our customers figure it out. But he said, in the meantime, I'm not going to be looking for people that know how to write or, or how to do Photoshop. I'm looking for people who can write prompts, right? Uh, so let me just create an image for you with MidJourney to show you how this works. I just typed in a close-up of a lion on the African plains, okay? And off it goes, and it creates four options for me to choose from. Now, I can like one of them and say, give me more variations that look close to this. Um, or I can say, increase the resolution of this one. I want to look at it closer. In this particular case, I'm going to uh, increase the re resolution of this particular image and uh, open it in a browser. And here's the final image that I ended up with. Now, that is so photorealistic, you can almost see the hairs on the lion's mane. And again, that is my image. It doesn't belong to anyone else. And that lion you're looking at there does not exist, right? That was just created by AI. Now, how fast is this moving? Well, if you look at the different versions of Mid Journey here, Rowan Atkinson, the actor, right? You can see how it has improved. Just the improvements from version four to version five over a three month period is amazing. And we're on version 5.3 right now. So it's just becoming just so lifelike. So now let's talk about AI as a programmer to actually write code, right? Um, today, 41% of all the code that's on GitHub is written by AI. GitHub is like a social network for coders where they upload their code, they you know, share it with each other, they comment on each other's code. Statistically, coders are 58% more effective when they're using AI, when they're using these tools. Andre Kaparthi, who's considered by many to be the greatest coder in the world, he's the guy who created the AI system for uh, Tesla's uh, co-pilot. Uh, he said he does 80% of his coding now with AI. So one coder can do the work of five. What does this mean for the future of coding? And I mean, if you have coders in your business, you need to expect more. If you have, if you're using coders like outside agencies or, or development companies, you need to expect more. We have all of our coders now using this and seeing huge quantum leaps. Let's talk about AI as a videographer, right? So if for any of you that use video, it might be customer demos, it might be training videos, orientation videos, you know that you, you got to create the script, you send somebody into the studio, he or she shoots the video, you know, then you got to go post-production editing, you edit it, you, it's finally produced, and then some things change. And you got to go back into the studio and edit it. You got to get releases signed, maybe the employee leaves the company, they're no longer there, you got to replace them with someone else. 
What if you could just jump over all of that, type out a script and have an avatar do it, right? And uh, so I'll show you exactly how. Hello everyone. I am excited to introduce your next convention keynote speaker, Mike Kaput, who will be delivering we a presentation We use this for a company convention. Marketing artificial intelligence, AI, marketing, and the future of business. Now that Mike was about six months ago. AI and the technology has become far greater even since. In fact, you can have you as the avatar now, simply but just by taking a picture of yourself, uh, it now renders as a 3D avatar. Uh, Runway ML is another platform. And again, we're living in a period where short form video is more important than ever. And we can just create these short form videos. This is the text, the prompt that's just plugged into the uh, the system, and it's cranking out this level of quality imagery. We can stitch these things together and ask it to do whatever we want it to do. So if you're currently using external video, you may want to bring that internally. If you've got an internal team, well, what, could they, what more could they be doing? We need to be doing a lot more video as marketers in all areas of our business, especially short form video. And there's a lot of AI tools that can help us with that. Now, how hard is this prompt writing? Um, Andre Kaparthi, who I mentioned earlier, he said the hottest new programming language in 2023 is English, right? It, we don't have to learn some coding language anymore. It's just writing English. Now, you might have heard the New York Times a while back. They ran a story saying that this new job, prompt engineers, is emerging. And they're talking about how companies are advertising $335,000 for prompt engineers. Well, my view on that is that that job is going to disappear as quickly as it came about because we can now use AI to write prompts. You can use ChatGPT to write a prompt for mid-journey. You don't even have to know how to write mid-journey prompts, right? So this is changing very quickly. In fact, you can go to a site called PromptBase, promptbase.com, and you can look at a bunch of images that you like and just buy the prompt for a couple of bucks. For $2, you could buy the prompt that created an image and then modify it slightly, you know, however you want. You could buy the, the prompts that created an application. Um, and just, this is where it, it gets really crazy here. Uh, AI as your personal assistant. And you're going to see a lot of movement in this space very quickly. Something called AutoGPT, which instead of just using a chatbot, it oversees and manages a team of chatbots. So let me give you an example of how I use this. I was looking for riding lessons for my 12-year-old daughter. I wanted to find English riding lessons. And so I went to AutoGPT and I said, find me uh, uh, the best options for English riding lessons within 20 minutes of my home. So it immediately made a list of the steps it was going to take to achieve that. Then it went out and scraped a bunch of websites for all the content to find those that are English, not Western riding. And then it went out to Google Maps and searched their address against my address to make sure it was within 20 minutes of my home. And then, when it, then it went out to Google Reviews to check the reviews on each of those companies, came back and gave me a table format output of my top three options with the uh, ratings of each of those, the price per hour, and it asked me if, it, if I'd like it to book a lesson. Lesson. Now, I can tell you, traditionally, I would have given that to my assistant to do, and she'd spend a couple of hours doing that. Now it's all being done in the background by AI. And this part of AI is moving very quickly. So what does this all mean? What does this all mean for small and medium-sized business people? What does it mean for you and I? Well, Charles Dickens, in his book, A Tale of Two Cities, he begins the book by saying, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Because this took place in the French Revolution, and for many, that revolution resulted in the best of times for some and the worst of times for others. I mean, if you read the news, some will say that this is the worst of times. The headlines saying that there's going to be hundreds of millions of jobs lost. But the reality is that AI will not replace people. AI will replace tasks. So let me give you an example. If you take three employees and you break down the work that each of those three employees do into all the different tasks, if we can automate and leverage AI for a bunch of those different tasks and we can remove those tasks from their plate, we've now freed up extra capacity. Now we can reorganize that work and it might mean that we've got one less employee needed. 
Uh, the question is, how are companies going to utilize this excess capacity? I mean, some companies are going to reduce their staff unquestionably and, and increase their profits. Other companies are going to reduce their staff and reinvest in the business, capital expenditures. Others are going to maintain their staff, but they're going to move faster. They're going to invest in the customer experience. They're going to lean into their growth. Um, there's a whole new category of investor that's emerging that's being known as AI arbitrage where companies are coming into industries, sleepy industries, sleepy companies, they're buying them up, they're automating the back ends of those businesses, taking out a huge chunk of the HR costs, and then selling the businesses for two or three times what they bought them for. Right? That's going to be happening in many industries. It may happen to your competition, for that matter. But it's going to be happening on a large scale. Um, so... If you think about what are the labor costs of your business or of any business, I mean, if it's a white collar business it might, like ours, you know, in the digital agency business, it might be 50%. It might be 40% if you're in a services business, maybe like our tutoring business. If you're in a, um, in a retail or food business, it might be 30%. But what if there was a way that you could actually take out that cost? Imagine a white collar consulting business. You know, would there be a way that you can actually replace consultants with AI? Like consultants? Well, Harvard and BCG, Boston Consulting Group, asked this exact question. And they took, and for those of you that know, Boston Consulting Group, like these are the big brains, right? Like McKinsey, these are the smart people. These aren't just average consultants. These are, uh, are the best. And they pitted AI against uh, the BCG consultants. And guess what they found? They found that AI did 12.1% faster work. It produced 25% 25.2% uh, more work. And here's the kicker: 40% better work than the best consultants, according to Harvard. So obviously, the consulting firms are leaning in large into this to be actually leveraging AI in a big way. Let me just show you a practical example of this. A digital marketing agency like the one we have with labor costs, most of it's, you know, people, these people sitting in desks, they're building PPC strategies, SEO strategies, they're writing content, they're creating designs. Labor is our number one cost, right? But what if we had a magic button that we could just press and 80% of that work could be done by AI? You know, what does that do to the bottom line profitability of the business? Right? And that's exactly what we've just spent the last six months doing in our business. Now, you might be saying, well, my business isn't really white collar. You know, it's a, uh, there's a lot of physical labor involved in my business. And there are businesses where that's the case. Um, and this is what most people are missing. We hear all about AI, but the thing we're not hearing about is the merger of AI and robotics. And that's what we're going to see in the next couple of years. You know, the, uh, the author William Gibson once said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. We're not talking about something that might come or that could come. We're talking about something that is already here. This is being used in hospitality and food services. Many of us have begun to experience it in fast food restaurants. AI is already here. Now, it's not just... Fast. It's, it's not just hospitality. For those of you that are familiar, you might have heard about uh, Tesla's Optimus robot. So humanoid robotics are on the way. Now, Elon Musk says that his, uh, uh, his Optimus robot will be $20,000, and it'll be here in less than a year. Now, even if he's half right, and it's two years, and it's $40,000, can you imagine the transformational impact this will have? You know, robots, they don't call in sick. They don't go on strike. They don't join unions. They don't leave after an eight-hour shift, right? The impact that this could have. And it's not just Elon Musk's company. There are companies around the world on the forefront of robotics. One of them is a Canadian company called Sanctuary AI. And I'll just show you a quick video, 60 seconds, 60 different tasks. And think about if there's any of these tasks you see here that might fit within your business.
Now, as futuristic as what you just saw might appear, the reality is that that world is just around the corner with this merger of AI and robotics. But as humans, we often tend to see things as they are as opposed to how they can be. If, if I were to tell you that most of us would have arrived at this event today and we would have you know, pulled out a smartphone in our pocket to get there and we'd get out of the car without even paying the driver, if I told you that 10 years ago, you'd wonder what I was talking about. It wouldn't make sense, right? But of course, we now know that one te technological advance or one company has changed the world and changed an industry. Um, if I told you that this taxi medallion, which is a license to drive a cab in New York City, if I told you that that was going to be going from over a million dollars to almost worthless, uh, I mean, you'd be scratching your head saying, what am I talking about? But one technological advance has made that a reality. And it's about to get a lot more strange because 5 million Uber drivers are about to leave behind the life that they love, the lifestyle, that job in the years to come because they'll be replaced by autonomous vehicles. My 12-year-old daughter will probably never have a driver's license. She'll probably never own a car. She won't need to any more than I need to own a cow because I want milk with my breakfast. Right? We're going to order transportation as a service, not as a product. And it's not just Uber that's being affected. 25 million professional drivers around the world, transport, delivery, Amazon drivers, will all be replaced by robotics. Now again, best of times, worst of times. I mean, this is bad for many. It's great for many others. Tens of thousands of lives will be saved every year based on auto collisions, right? I mean, the reality is that AI doesn't text and drive. It doesn't drink and drive. It doesn't speed. The small number of accidents that have happened with autonomous vehicles, most have been caused by the other vehicle with a human driving. And there's a fraction of the accidents that happen with humans behind the wheel. So this is a very significant change. And we're not even talking about the adjacent industries, the car insurance industry, the automotive repair, the collision industry, all those industries significantly impacted because of one technological change. And so the question for you is, where will the disruption be happening in your business? Where will the disruption be happening in your industry? Uh, the reality is the technology, this is the slowest technology will ever move, right? It's only accelerating from here on in. The good news is that I'll leave you with today, the good news is that we can ride this wave. We can lunge ahead of our competition by leaning into learning and curiosity and discovery at this transformational period in the birthing of this revolution. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes uh, from Peter Senge, who wrote the book, The Fifth Discipline. And in that book, he says that the only sustainable competitive advantage we have is the speed at which we learn. It's not our IP, it's not our market share, it's not our you know, brand equity, but it's the speed at which we learn. And to help you with some of that learning, we put together a site, AI by WSI, and again, that QR code where you can access the slides from the presentation and the AI summary of the, the slides. You can download our book on ChatGPT and AI. You can download an AI readiness survey to find out whether or not your company is ready. You can watch some in-depth videos. Uh, and learn a lot more about AI there. So in closing, we have a really exciting future ahead of us and the opportunity of a lifetime. So it's time to fasten our seatbelts, rev up our engines of learning and curiosity, and enjoy the ride ahead. Thank you.